The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narcanon Ojai. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. I believe this is episode number 156, which means that this is um, the end of our third year of podcasting, weekly podcasts every single week. And we're going to keep going. We're definitely not done with this. We got to keep going until the addiction epidemic in this country and across the world is completely gone. And that's probably not going to be in the next couple of weeks. So, of course, right now, um, and this podcast is going to go up in uh, end of April, but being recorded um, March. And yeah, we're in the middle of the COVID-19 virus uh, situation. So I hope that you're staying healthy. And I also hope that you are getting treatment if you need it or getting treatment for your loved ones if you know someone who's addicted. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and review our podcast wherever you listen to it. Also, please be sure and check us out on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel now. And whenever our guests are willing to be videoed, we are videoing these interviews. And um, yeah, we're just trying to get out there, maybe in front of people who don't know about podcasts, but who frequent YouTube. So if you would be helpful if you would go to YouTube and subscribe to our channel and review us there. Today, we're going to be talking to a lady named Janet Colbert. And Janet Colbert's background is in neonatal nursing. She was caring for drug-addicted babies at a children's hospital in Broward County, Florida. She could not just walk away, and that's understandable. She founded Stop Now, and that's S-T-O-P-P Now, which stands for Stop the Organized Pill Pushers Now. And she began holding peaceful protests in front of the pill mills. More and more parents that were experiencing the horrors of a loved one addicted to drugs or those that had their lives destroyed by losing their loved one to the opiate came to join their group. County commissioners, mayors, and the DEA came and protested alongside this organization. The drug-addicted babies Colbert was caring for at a children's hospital were all testing positive for opiates and sometimes polysubstance abuse, more than one drug. Heroin was almost non-existent in Florida back then in 2009, but that, of course, has now changed. Heroin, too, is an opiate and much cheaper than prescription drugs. Eight out of ten heroin users start with the not-so-innocent, highly addictive pain pill. Janet Colbert authored the book, Stop Now, to expose much of the corruption and greed that has and continues to fuel the opiate epidemic. Let's talk to Janet Colbert. Janet Colbert, instead of Colbert. Yes, uh, yes Johnny. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. You bring a completely different perspective from anyone else we have had on the podcast. And I'm I'm excited to have you here. I'm a Thank little you. bit scared about what you're <laughs> going to talk about. I'll just be honest. Um, but that's okay. It, it needs to be brought up and it needs to be talked about. So, you are retired. You were a neonatal nurse. Correct. What, what in your background led you to become a neonatal nurse? I actually, it was a second career for me. I mean, I worked for AT&T for 20 years and I oh, went wow. back to school to become a nurse. And that was my area of interest, those little premature, tiny babies. And so I went, I worked during the day. I went to school at night until I actually started the nursing program itself. I was in an accelerated program, so I had to, at that point, quit my job and full-time nursing and clinicals and that kind of thing. Wow. What part of the country was this? In Broward County, Florida. Broward County. Okay, so that's where you you started your career in nursing. And then um, you... Tell me about what that experience was like being a neonatal nurse. I it would be tough, I would think, with tiny little babies, but tell me about that. Okay, it, it is, but for the most part, well, we have good outcomes. Like, I don't think I could ever do pediatric intensive care nursing with the 
you know, near drownings and the car accidents and that kind of thing. Um, or cancer we, even would be hard, yeah, I think, with yeah, kids. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Burn unit, things like oh, that. Oh my yep. God, those poor patients, those poor people that go through that. So for the most part, we get to know our parents very, very well because we spend a lot of time with them. A, a normal delivery is 40 weeks. And if you get a baby that's born 25, 26, 27 weeks, those babies are with us a very long time and we see their parents every day and we get to love them and love their baby and you know see them through all the ups and downs and you know i i stay in touch with one family <laughs> i still do and he's about 10 or 11 years old but i just love them and um and actually they live in your area uh. now now they've moved but um and then we have our NICU reunions and by then we don't recognize those babies anymore but we recognize their parents and so that part i loved right now what year did you start um working with the uh, preemie little preemie babies oh my gosh oh boy uh i think i graduated nursing school in 1994 and I first did med surge, which is always a good background to have. What is and, that? What is med surge? Uh, like people that go in for gallbladder operations, they're usually on a med surge floor. And we had a lot of sickle cell patients and things like that. Okay. Uh, and then you get all your skills, you know, really honed in before you go on to take care of these little 500 gram babies, that kind of thing. So. And we had extensive training for the unit, and it was a you know a great experience. And like I say, most of the babies you get to see go home. And what? So this is the mid '90s. What percentage then did you see of drug-related pre premature births? Once, what percentage would you say? Once in a while, we might have a cocaine baby or something of that nature and would have a little rocker bed that would keep them in nothing like we saw starting in like 2009 I want to say where our unit was full of drug addicted babies and at the time we as nurses we didn't know what was going on we didn't know about the pill mills and all of that i was to later find that out as i investigated as i started writing letters to our legislators and i thought oh as soon as i let them know what's going on that i know saint joseph's hospital in tampa because they were very open about the situation there and they reported in the newspaper about 30 percent of their admissions to their neonatal unit was drug addicted babies. I would say there were times when ours were that high, uh, maybe sometimes 20% of our unit, but as soon as one would go not home, they would usually be, our social worker would go to court, they'd be going to, they'd be taken away from their parents, they would go to a foster home or a grandmother. Our foster care system is overwhelmed. They don't have enough beds for these babies. Right. And you so know, you say you say thirty percent, and I get emotional. I, <laughs> I mean, know that's, that's I know. such a high percentage. Um, maybe this is something that you you know. Um, does an an addicted mother does the fact of drug addiction cause premature births? The, Do you it, know, it doesn't. However, okay. I found out one time I was at a. Uh, Pam Bondi, when she was attorney general in Florida, had started a NAS task force. NAS stands for Neonatal Abstinence Syndrome, for those that don't know, task force. And it was in effect for not that long. But I was invited to go to one of the meetings that was here in Broward County. And there was a doctor speaking, and he was doing a lot of research in, um, I think it was in Shands Hospital. And I had asked him because at the time we had a baby on our unit that was only 30 weeks and showed no signs of being a drug addicted baby. However, his mother 
you know, signed out AMA and she was completely no doubt and they had drug tested her and then drug tested the baby for that reason. So I asked him, are there, what, what, what about this baby that has no signs? Like we would have never known. And he said, for some reason, and I think the cutoff date he gave me was 31 weeks and under, they show no signs of withdrawal. So then my question is, and like you say, how much this bothers you and you can't sleep at night, was how many are we missing? Right. How many go home with parents that are going to neglect them because it's more important that they go out and buy what they need to get through the day and leave the baby unattended or things like that. Right. So what you're saying is that if the baby is uh, born in less than 30 weeks, that oftentimes they don't show? That's what the... his research said, yes. Now, that's interesting to me because I I don't know if you listened to this particular podcast that we did, but a young man reached out to us from South Dakota. His name is Austin. And he um, is a former addict, and he and his wife was an addict as well when she was pregnant. And because of how sick she would get when she tried to withdraw, um, they decided to, she would just continue to take drugs while she was pregnant. And I don't know if their baby was premature or not, but I know that their baby was born without any drugs in her system. And I thought that was kind of like a how miracle. How could that be? Yeah. yeah. I mean, how, they, how on earth could that be? And so I don't... test the that, baby? And there was oh, yeah. no drugs? Oh, yeah. Wow. And and then after the baby was born, that they got clean. They got sober. They're oh, still clean good. and sober. They're... Oh. Um, the thing that... The reason why he reached out to us was because he said, you know, we're, we're by ourselves. We have no support group. And, mm. you know, your podcast helps us kind of oh, stay sane, which was, oh, which was very nice. But when... When he talked about the fact that his baby was born, you know, with no drugs in her system, I was like, yeah, I didn't know how that happened. Okay. So if they carry the baby closer, well, what would, but you, you had babies that were less than 30 weeks, maybe that had drugs in their system. Did you have any of those? See, this was the only one that it was so obvious this mother was on drugs that they okay. tested her and then they tested the baby but okay. normally you know newborn nursery they, they get delivered they go to a newborn nursery and the new the nursery nurses would pick up on something and oh yeah send them up to us and we would you know go through the testing and and that kind of thing um the babies i don't know if you want me to describe now what it was like for them that. Well, I was just going to ask you that, and <laughs> if I start to cry a little bit, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, at first, here's another factor that's involved in this. At first, you know, the placenta's cut. That's when they are, you know, stop receiving drugs. So it takes them a couple of days before they go through withdrawal. So there's another thing. Are some of them going home? again, that it wasn't picked up. But the ones that were picked up, the babies on our unit, they um, very stiff, stiff arms and limbs. So they're using all of the disciplines, physical therapy, speech therapy. They can't get their mouth coordinated enough to suck a bottle because of the frustration and the screaming you know they they scream and they have their diaper area has a, a rash because they have diarrhea they it's very very sad to see and we were getting you know sometimes the mothers would be there and sometimes the fathers would call and they'd be in jail because when this was first happening they were arresting them for <laughs> selling part of their stash to make you know make do Whereas, and I would say to the reporters when they were out there with us, when we, we started holding protests in front of the pill mills once we found out about them, and I can explain that later. But, you know, I'd say the real, the real drug dealers inside this building, not the one that's, you know, comes out with four or 500 pills and they're, you know, trying to sell part of their stash. And, I mean, it, it was just really just... Just, and some of them, 
you know, were there longer than others? And I'm sure that has to do with how much the mother's taking. Some of them right. are there a couple months. Some of them. So, so Janet, the baby is stiff. Is that because the baby is in withdrawal? Is that one of the manifestations of withdrawal that the baby goes through? Yes, yes, yes. Very tight, tight, like, you know, frustrated if you had someone that was just putting their fist and clenching them and clenching their mouth. And that was part of it. Yes. And what would you guys do to sort of alleviate that? We were giving them morphine and clonidine okay. every three okay. hours to ease their withdrawal symptoms. And then we would do that NAS testing. How long did they sleep until they woke up screaming and needed that medication again? How well did they eat? How, you know, those kinds of things. And then would you step them down to the yes. point where they didn't? Okay. We would step them down or up. And then they naturally had to be off of everything before they were allowed to be discharged home. Right. How long average would it take to go through that process with a baby? You know, I think I read in a national study, the average is about 21 to 28 days. We had some that needed extensive. We had one baby that um, her, she could not eat at all. No matter how much speech therapy tried, it was, they just could not get her to, to dip, suck orally what she needed to do. They had to put a feeding tube in her. I mean, we used feeding tubes, but I mean a permanent by the stomach feeding tube and had to feed her in that manner before she could be discharged to the foster care system. Wow. Wow. I don't, I don't know if I have, um, we don't know how many people listen to this podcast that are addicts themselves or loved ones of addicts, but if you're listening and either you're pregnant and addicted or you know someone who's pregnant and addicted, you really want to put a baby through that? I'm just, I'm just asking, okay? And yet, I don't know, and Janet, maybe you do, I don't know if, if a woman's pregnant and she's addicted to heroin, if she goes through withdrawal, what does that do to the fetus? See, it's not good for the fetus. They can go into <laughs> seizures in utero. So at the time, like I say, I am retired now. At the time, there were studies that the mother, first of all, seek help seek professional help. Let your doctor know that you are on heroin or opiate, oxycodone, things of that nature. Let them know because there is help now. And I believe they administer methadone, is the last I heard, to these mothers so that they can bring them down. And maybe so this mother that you did speak of, maybe that's why, although methadone, a baby born to methadone withdrawal is also very hard to withdraw from. The uh, methadone's again. worse than heroin. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. synthetic. I mean, yeah. based on what we know with, you know, not babies, but just people coming right. off of methadone, right. it's way right. harder. I don't right. think she did anything. I think, you know, I don't know what their story was. Maybe the baby was premature and that's why the baby was clean. Maybe, but, uh, maybe. Yeah, I don't know because I can't figure that stopped. out. You've given me a... Something well, like, except oh. that the doctor did say that sometimes if the babies are premature, they're, yes, yes, that's they're okay. The only but that, that's just uh, unbelievable. But it is very important that you, the fact you just mentioned, if someone listening is pregnant, don't just go off cold turkey. Seek help. Oh. Very and important. Get medical help because you're yes, going to need yes. to step down yes. so that your baby doesn't go into immediate withdrawal. Right. right. Um, oh, anyway, I don't, I, that's. Uh, <laughs> that's sad. Um, so have you, I don't know if you've heard this. Um, I obviously want to get into, you know, stop now and everything that you're doing, but we had a gentleman on the podcast a few couple weeks ago talking about, um, he's from drug free America and drug free America is very avidly against legalization of marijuana. I am too. <laughs> and he said that there are states where doctors are recommending that pregnant mothers um, take marijuana for nausea. Oh, my God. Well, you know, don't forget the opiate epidemic. 
I mean, we may not ever be able to stop all addictions, but we should be able to stop this one because yeah. it's doctors that are prescribing it. Yep. Don't forget yep. that. This no. is where that whole thing, all they had to do in these pill mills is to find a doctor that would prescribe it, and they had no trouble finding them. That's right. That's exactly right. We had Pam Bondi on the podcast, and we had actually met with her before she was elected attorney general. And when when we asked her what were a couple of the things that she wanted to address, um, I think first and foremost was, sh- foremost was shutting down the pill mills in Florida. Mm-hmm. And then, as you know, she hired um, Dave Ehrenberg, and right, that was his right, project. Right, right. You know, and he's he down in your area, right? He is in West Palm Beach now. He's State in West Attorney Palm, West That's Palm right. Beach, and now he's very involved in trying to close the part two of this. All of these sober homes that are so bad. Right. Now, did you encounter any babies that were only? I hate to say only, but were only addicted to marijuana? Did that ever come up? Yeah, it did. Oh, it did. Okay. Yeah. And would they have the same type of reaction as? No, no. The opioids. What kind of reaction did you see with them? Some of them, we didn't really, I, I, I can remember one vividly. Like we, I don't remember really even testing for that, but I know one of the nurse practitioners would talk to the mother and question her and found out she was taking that. And so she, you know, put measures in place. Um, one of our doctors said it was okay for those mothers to even breastfeed. So, you know, there was different, you know, feelings on that. Wow. So you're seeing, you were seeing these premature babies going through withdrawal. Or non, they were mostly full-term babies, remember, okay. that we were but, seeing going through withdrawal. So you would get the full-term babies in addition right. Okay. Right, right, right. Our unit isn't only for premature babies. Okay. Neonatal, you kind of think of that. And yes. one thing if I can mention right now, too, um, there's Narcan. Maybe people are very familiar with Narcan now, bringing right. back someone from death. Right. We use That's in every hospital in the United States, every L&D delivery room and NICU. And the reason for that is... If a mother, like prior to all of this, okay, prior to any of this happening, if a mother is given a narcotic during a very, you know, tough labor, which was normal to do right. so, right, and you went to the delivery and the baby came out flaccid, gray, not moving at all, you would give Narcan in, a, in their thigh and within a fraction of a second, they would be pink and crying and moving their limbs. It is a wonderful drug. Now, you would not give this to a drug-addicted baby because it could send them into immediate seizures. But Narcan is a very safe drug to give. Interesting. You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com, or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727-314-7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more information on our sponsor, Narcan on Ojai, visit their website at narcononojai.org. That's N-A-R-C-O-N-O-N-O-J-A-I dot org. Or call 1-866-231-5924. That's 1-866-231-5924. Sometimes, the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one-hour consultation with Bobby. 
Okay. So where was, you know, it's interesting. I'm going to ask you this. When we talk to former addicts, like people who are recovered from drug or alcohol addiction, one of the things we always po- um, ask them to point up is what was their point of no return? What was the point at which they went, you know, either I'm going to get clean or I'm basically going to die. I'm going to go down that road and die. So for you, what was your point of no return where you said enough is enough and I have to do something about this? Well, all of us on the unit like would, would be like, what's, what's going on? We had no idea what was going on. And um, at one point, I'm like, you know, we can't. I, I got to do something about this. I can't just ignore them. So at the same time, one of my very good friends, Renee, had a, a child that she was doing tough love with that was taking drugs. Now, the hospital called her. He overdosed. And they, she went down there to his bedside. This is going to really make you cry. She, um, he told her about the pill mills. We didn't know why we had all these drug addict babies on our unit. He told her all about the pill mills. You just walk in with an old x-ray or you walk in feigning pain and you can walk out with 500 pills. At the time, the doctors could even dispense from the pill mills. That was a law that had put in fact to these rural areas. People needed a medication, so hard for them to get to a pharmacy. Down here, we have one on every corner. There was no reason for it, but at the time. So about two weeks later, Blaine had visited one of the pill mills and he was on drugs and on State Road 84, walked in front of a car and was hit and killed. And so Renee asked me if I would help her write letters, because now we knew about the pill mills, if I would help her write letters about what was going on and Tallahassee would surely do something about this. At that time, there was 150 pill mills just in Broward County, more than McDonald's, more than Starbucks. Oh, my God. God. So that's how we started out. And then civic associations would ask us to come speak. And, and we would have people say, oh, with the lines wrapped around the building. And they're all over the place. I thought, finally, somebody is doing something for arthritis. How good. You know, they had no idea. No idea. And so Tallahassee, that when they wrote back to me, the, the paragraph about the drug addicted baby, they would just leave that blank. They would just say, oh, we know doctors are diverting, you know, doctors prescribe and then the addicts are diverting the meds. And I, I wrote back this one time. I don't know if you know, um, Andrew. Oh my gosh. I can't believe I forget his name right now. I write to him all the time and talk to him on the phone once in a while in the attorney general's office. I can't believe his name just escaped me, but he wrote me back that because at the time he was um, assistant to um, the governor at the time. And this is before he went on to the attorney general's office, Chris, Chris, not Chris Christie, uh, Governor Christie. Right. I'm saying the name wrong. Not Chris Christie okay. in New Jersey. That's all anyway, right. <laughs> anyway, anyway I, I wrote him back because the new, the new Times, I don't know if you're familiar with the New Times magazine. It was distributed for free and Dunkin' Donuts and all over the beach and these little vendors and everything like that. Ten pages of pill mills. And Dr. So-and-so has left, no questions asked. They gave coupons. Um, They gave... uh, so, So when I wrote back to him, I sent him one of the pages and I said to him, Andrew Bernard is his name, don't even... When you write to me, call them doctors. Seriously. They advertise on the same page as penis enhancements. And I sent him that page. Oh. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I mean, it was so bizarre. There was a taxi cab uh, I learned later that was going all through town with a banner on top, Oxy's $3, uh, office visits $250. Because it it was legal. All oh, of this was I, legal. Yeah. So, you know, how, oh. how bizarre is wow. that? Wow. Yeah. I had so, I had no idea. I mean, I knew about pill mills. You know, we knew about it. And this was before we started doing the podcast. But that's, 
mind blowing. Yeah, yeah. And I met oh, Andrew so Bernard cool. later on one of my trips to Tallahassee. I usually see him all the time. <laughs> And when I brought that up, oh, his face turned all red. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay, so your friend Renee's son overdosed. And then what did you do then? You started, well, she I started writing both, letters and you started writing letters. Right, Sorry. right. And it brought no results. So then we started holding protests, peaceful protests. Nothing like you see today where they throw bricks through windows. Outside of the pill mills, doctors are using their license to kill you're killing our children. Babies are being born addicted to bring attention to this. And right. more and more mothers started joining us. It was on the front page of the Herald and the Sun Sentinel. And uh, so people would come out that their child had been lost to this addiction or they were in the thrones of addiction. And they would bring us uh, Macy's bags full of the prescriptions that their child was receiving from, from these doctors because in 2010, they did pass a law that um, they can no longer dispense. So, and, and I'll say this about Pam Bondi, the one thing I, I do not like about was, it's political, okay? She was, there was a quote, and this is a very true fact, that 98% of the top dispensing doctors in all of the United States are in Florida. And she right. made the statement, now that number is zero, without explaining it. And when I first heard it, I'm like, why is she lying? That's not true. Well, dispensing had stopped. Uh. So they're not dispensing. They're writing a prescription and saying, here, go fill this there. I see. I see. So they're all still here, you know. And, I mean, so this is... And this goes on and on. This goes, it still hasn't stopped today. With, and I, I'd be in an, an office of a legislator's office and it'd go, well, I thought the problem was over in Florida. Well, no, I know you thought that because you were kind of led to believe that, but that's not true. Wow. Wow. Okay, peaceful <laughs> protests. You still doing them? The last one we did was quite some time ago, although we did just have one. If anyone wants to check my blog, stopnow.com, and it's S-T-O-P-P. -P. It stands for Stop the Organized Pill Pushers Now, dot right. com. Um, I have now, uh, the last blog before the one I have on there now, there had been a protest in West Palm Beach because Purdue Pharma, just prior to declaring bankruptcy, had made a large uh purchase of land in West Palm Beach, uh, oh, wow. a couple of businesses. But so we were out there in front to bring attention to that. And there's a father that speaks um, on the news. And he said, and this is for people that think this can never happen to my child, you know, right. and until it does. But he said, he came down from Pennsylvania to be there, him and his wife, lovely people. And he said that the first time I heard the word Oxycontin, my son was dead. <sighs> and it's still happening. I met him. That happened in 2001. And I met a mother at that protest that her child just, just died in September. I mean, it's still happening. Wow. 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 Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I, know. I don't know what else to say. So you wrote a book. I did. And the book is about everything you've been telling me about today? Yes. Uh, it's called Stop Now also. Um, it's about, it starts out with the neonatal unit, what, how I found out about this and the pill mills. I have a few personal stories from some mothers. The whole book's not about that or you couldn't possibly read it. Right. And then I have our, our struggle in trying to get legislation, going to Tallahassee, going to Washington, D.C. My, my motto that I have on the back of my cards is, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And that's a quote by Edmund Burke. And there's a lot of good people not doing anything. And, you know, it's, it's some counties, this has wiped out entire generations and there's an epidemic we're going through now that may, or they're saying could, 
wipe out an entire generation of the elderly people. This has wiped out entire generations of, you know, some 20 year olds, although at one time, because there are many deaths taken as prescribed too. They didn't all right. start out on the joyride. And there's a, an age rate between 55 and 64 that at one time they were the highest number of deaths. Right. So anybody that thinks, oh, well, they're, you know, they should have never done this. Well, you know. We talk about that okay. on the podcast. Okay. There's no, Good. it's Good. not just the bum under right. the bridge. Exactly. It's the, exactly. it's the white collar, high income student. It's the mom, you know, it's the, it's the elderly, you know, right. there's, right. I, right. I, I had the woman who um, used to cut my hair. The only reason I say used to is because I'm letting it grow. But her mother-in-law was addicted to painkillers mm -hmm. and, you know, operated pretty much the same as a teenager addicted to heroin, you know, mm -hmm. with the same manipulation and the same lying and the same, yes. you know, the whole thing. Yes. Um, and she was, you know, she was probably in her 70s, you know, mm -hmm. so it's not, it's not, it's not any demographic it's all demographics right right and we talk about that a lot i also mentioned well in the back of the book there's a, a doctor that was finally charged with first degree murder in west palm beach and i went up to that trial every day i wanted to sit there in the courtroom and see you know because for so long there was no consequences to either the pain clinic owner or to the doctor and finally you know now there is Wow. And so I have that court trial. It's very interesting. You learn a lot about what happens in a courtroom. Uh, in the back of the book, I have that. And then I also have appendix with the CDC guidelines, what they are. You know, there's great opposition to those now by those who are, it hurts the bottom line of the drug companies. And right. the drug companies are the most powerful lobbyists in Washington, D.C. Yes, and they, they are. are trying to abolish the CDC guidelines. Wow. When w when did this doctor go to trial, the one in West Palm? Uh, I want to say 2016. Okay. Have there been more since then? There have been. And there have been clinic owners when, and I, and so I've gotten to know federal prosecutors and state prosecutors. And I know when this one pill mill that was up on Commercial Boulevard when he was arrested, Vincent Coangelo is his name. When he was arrested, he was making $150,000 a day. How much money do you oh need? God. And how many died wow. from going to that pain clinic? Well, well I, I, yeah. So what's next for you? <laughs> well, we were supposed to have a Hill Day uh, June 3rd, but um, I don't know. Things aren't looking, you know, too good for traveling right now. Or does uh, that mean so you go up to Capitol Hill and uh, yeah. protest up there? Do you actually yeah, do a protest? Or? Uh, we have in the past gone okay. and protested in front of the White House. This time we were just going to go see our legislators and, you know, meet with uh, their aides. I would love to meet with President Trump. I really would because... First of all, I would like to thank Melania Trump for giving a voice to these NAS babies. I've been trying for 10 years. And, and I, I really think that he's a mover and a shaker. And I, I think that possibly, I mean, until we do something about these drug lobbyists paying all of the, you know, campaign fees for all of these legislators. I'm going in there and asking them to save lives, but somebody else is at the back door saying, we'll pay for your entire campaign. Right. <laughs> right. That's got to end. And the FDA. And the FDA. Yeah. The, anyone that's in a position of approving something for a drug company is doing so and then quitting the FDA and moving on. To and work into the for the drug company exactly yeah 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 yeah. there's yeah. got to be i don't know whether that would have to be a law passed by congress or just something put into effect that once you work here you could never go on to be on a board of a drug company and collect stocks and that's again ridiculous the ama <laughs> 
I tried many times <laughs> to notify the AMA, okay? And yeah. No satisfaction whatsoever. Now, wow. they are now suing the, the state of North Dakota, saying it's very unfair for the government to tell a doctor what he must state to a patient standing in front of him trying to seek an abortion. It's not, they can't say it's just a bunch of tissue. Now they have to say, this is a baby, okay? That's not allowed, so they're suing them. But they allowed convicted felons to tell the doctors in these pill mills what to prescribe and how much, and they were silent. Wow, wow. I don't, I, another podcast that we did, I don't know if you listened to it, was a, um, there was a, an investigative reporter, Mary Sue Connolly, and she made a documentary about um, McKesson, drug um, distributor dumping all of the opioids into West Virginia. Right. And one of the key, uh, we won't call him a doctor, let's call him a prescriber, was right. this Dr. Massey, and he's now working for the state of Virginia. And yeah. he went to federal prison for oh the illegal prescription of these opioids. And now he works for the state of West Virginia. Yeah. It's There's, unbelievable. Right, it is. There was a Senate investigation, so-called Senate investigation. All of this could have been closed down in those letters are dated. I have them. I have some of them in my book, a couple of them, just so the readers can see them. Uh, in May of 2012, they had all the evidence they needed to go after these drug companies about how uh, Jayco was paid $12 million dollars to make the fifth vital sign. You know how important and imperative that was? A hospital, if a JACO survey is coming out, they are frantic because if they lose their JACO survey, they'll lose all the Medicare payments. They, the hospital have to close down, so they'll do whatever they want. So at that time, it's since changed, um, pain became the fifth vital sign. Wow. Yeah. And the Federation Board of Medicine how much money, that's a question, how much money were you given to distribute the book by Scott Fishman claiming the undertreatment of pain in America? And they, they distributed that to doctors going to Board of Medicine meetings. And that same phrase that was coined by the drug companies was stated by uh, AMA president too about the under-treatment of pain in America. So all of these government agencies, or most of them, I should say, are receiving payments from the drug wow. companies. That's got to stop. There's got to be a conflict of interest there somewhere. Yeah. It's just, it's unethical, yeah, to put it mildly. At best, yeah. It's criminal, but it's... It is criminal. At least it's unethical. So how can, where can people get your book? It's available on Amazon. It's on, available on um, Barnes and Noble. Uh, online, all this online. Chris, nobody can leave their house now. Anyway. Right. <laughs> and it's Stop Now, S T O P P Now. Yes. And it's by Janet Colbert. Yes. And I want to also, um, well, I'm going to ask you first if, if there was just one message you could put out to mothers, parents, addicts, anybody listening to the podcast, what's the one thing you would want to get across to them if they take just one thing away? Please get involved. Please get involved. We have to have a louder voice. Uh, you know, the old saying, the squeaky wheel gets oiled. Um, on stopnow.com, I do have a uh, one section, current projects, things that we're working on. Uh, another thing, and I have this in the book too, um, uh, we have, uh, you know, DEA versus Walgreens. We have the court documents where some of these pharmacies went from under 100000 a year distributing to well over $2 million, almost $3 million. And what did they do? They passed legislation removing authority from DEA in this environment. So I do have under current projects, yes, that bill number, That's how insane. this... Yes, how this first came about. And there is another bill, uh, no sense in me giving the bill numbers now. I mean, it is on the website um, that amends that to remove that and give DEA back the authority they need. And wow. it's not going anywhere. 
So we need people. And right now, again, our legislators are pretty busy with other things. I understand that. But there's two epidemics here that really need to be stopped now. <laughs> That's right. And when the COVID-19 virus um, danger is over, the addiction epidemic is still going to be there. Yes. So there's no, there's not a quick end to that one, whereas there hopefully will be a quick end to the virus. Yes. Jenna, thank you so much oh, for, for being on doing. the podcast today. And thank you for everything you're doing. And you. I wish you huge success. And I'm glad that we are able to give you maybe a little bit more of a voice to what you're doing, because I think it's so important. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And you're lovely you're, to speak to. You are welcome. Thank you. Wow. That was uh, quite the interview. When I, she mentioned that there were 30% of babies at the hospital in Tampa that were born addicted to drugs, that just grabs my mother's heart and squishes it very tight. If you're listening to this and you know someone who's addicted, if you have lost someone to addiction, make your voice heard. This epidemic is huge. And while there is all this brouhaha out there for COVID-19, maybe by the time this podcast goes up, it'll be over. But while this is going on, please remember that the, epi the addiction epidemic is way, way bigger in this country than COVID-19 will ever be. And you can make your voice heard and you can help do something about it. Maybe you think just my little voice isn't going to do any good, but your little voice joined with other voices is going to make a difference. So do something about it. If you know someone who's addicted, get them into treatment. Do it now. If you've lost someone to addiction, make it known. Scream it on your social media. Demand that someone take action. But do something about it. Thank you for listening today. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And also check us out on YouTube and subscribe on YouTube. You have a good week, and we will be back again next week. Thank you so much for listening. You have been listening to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. For more information on Narconon Ojai, call 866-231-5924 or visit www.narcononojai.org. Narconon is a non-12-step rehabilitation program based on the works of L. Ron Hubbard.